Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Voices for Social Justice. That's Voices of Innovative, Compassionate Experts in Society. Through this podcast, the Constellation Center at Georgia Tech aims to build an alliance of forward thinking and transformational experts who can help us navigate through some hard conversations, including the impacts of racism and bigotry in computing education, the negligence of lifting students of color in STEM, and the lack of equitable access to upward mobility for women, uh, particularly for women of color. It's also important for us to acknowledge the significance of Black History Month and to take a moment to reflect on the struggles and progress uh, related to racial justice and equity in America. Um, we've gone through a lot. We've gone through so much turmoil in the last several years. Uh, largely at the hands of white nationalists who do not value black lives as equally as their own. But we've also seen some remarkable signs of hope. For example, with the inauguration of Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, the first woman of color who is black and South Asian. My name is Lynn Diaz. I am a director at the Constellation Center and I host this podcast. So let's get into it. I'm super excited to introduce our special guest today. Welcome, Dr. Nikki Washington. Uh, she's a professor of the practice of computer science at Duke University and the author of a book called Unapologetically Dope, Lessons for Black Women and Girls in Surviving and Thriving in the Tech Field. Um, Nikki, I am so, so excited that you're here. Um, I also just wanted to say I learned that you were the first black female faculty member at Howard University in their CS department. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you, you for having me. Yeah, no, no problem. I also learned that you worked for the Aerospace Corporation. <laughs> I did. I did. All of these <laughs> hidden gems. <laughs> and did nine years of internships at IBM. Um, you were also the first black woman to get a doctorate at North Carolina State University. In computer wow. science. In computer science, gotcha, mm -hmm. in computer mm -hmm. science. Well, welcome again, and thank you um, for spending some time with us. We, Nikki, we wanna get into some aspects of your book in a bit, but to, but to start, um, uh, you know, actually this is, I would just wanna say, this is the, sort of the first time, at least in my lifetime, you know, that we've heard some serious efforts to diversify high offices in our government with more women, LGBTQ, uh, people and, and people of color. You are also a woman of many incredible firsts. Um, for you personally, what is the significance of a woman of color, you know, being elected to vice president and how do you think this changes things for women? So for me, I think the election of Kamala Harris means that black girls, Asian American girls can see uh, themselves in someone and they can see that they can rise to the highest ranks in this country particularly women who identify as of color are often so marginalized that we feel like a lot of times if a white woman hasn't accomplished it, then how in the world will we? And I think this is a testament to the fact that uh, we don't have to wait for someone else to do it first. We, uh, it's unfortunate that this is, that Kamala Harris is meeting so many firsts, right? So she's the first black person. She's the first woman. She's the first Asian American. And then she's the first with all of these intersecting identities. And, and that speaks to a number of things for me. One, the good part is that it opens doors for so many other women who look like her or whole parts of her identity. Uh, it makes space for the fact that HBCUs have and always will be extremely relevant in this country. And there's so much push around understanding more about HBCUs like Howard, Hampton, John C. Smith, Winston-Salem mm -hmm. State, you name it. Um, there's also this issue, I feel like, though, on the negative side, where we're seeing a lot of backlash as a result of this. And it's not just 
with Kamala, right? You see it with people like Pete Buttigieg, like you talked about. The fact that there are more um, more people with diverse identities in office now is infuriating people. It's it's wild to me to know that um, I think it's the Secretary of the Interior is the first indigenous person yeah. um, in a position that is so important for people of indigenous uh, backgrounds. Like, it's wild to know that this is the first time that's happening and this is the first time that people will be able to see individuals who look like them making decisions for them. But we see also on the flip side that there are a lot of people who don't want that to happen. And I just saw on Twitter today, it was something uh, someone tweeted about uh, the trigger for white rage is black advancement. And we're seeing that flip side of, you know, all of these firsts that are happening that should not be first in 2021 are happening because for once in our lifetime, uh, black voters in specific areas like Philly, Atlanta, you know, Detroit, um, Milwaukee and Flint, they were no longer disenfranchised. And you had Navajo Nation who was who really was able to make change in Arizona. And we're seeing the good as well as the bad of that. So I, I feel like a lot of these issues that we're seeing right now that play out live in the middle of Black History Month are because people are finally being able to see um, their votes matter, the representation of themselves show up, and other people who have worked so long to suppress those things are now totally um, upset and scrambling to figure out how do we continue to hold that power and control that we should have never had. Yeah, so, I mean, you speak about the importance of representation, which, I mean, it totally, to me, sort of transcends, you know, everything um, in, in education, in, in, you know, upward mobility, and, um, you know, particularly for students in STEM, um, you know, if they don't see themselves in the discipline, it's, it, it makes it even harder for them to realize, you know, that they can be a part of that discipline. Um, so uh, I want to transition then, I think, into your book, um, uh, Unapologetically Dope. And um, I want to bring up a couple of parts or sections in that book, particularly one chapter that um, is titled Know Your Worth. Know Your Worth. Um, you know, you recall an incident in that chapter with your sixth grade math teacher mm -hmm. regarding a conversation about Black History Month. And mm -hmm. ultimately, she says something to you, and I'm quoting. Um, she says, you know, it's people like you that give Blacks a bad rep. Can, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about that, you know, about what happened and the importance of this story in your book and what we can learn from it? Yeah, so that was a really... Um... It was an eye-opening moment for me. That was probably one of those, you know, you can always think back to the first time that race became something that stood out to you and your race yeah. specifically as being othered. Um, and that was it for me. So it was the middle of Black History Month, sixth grade math. And my teacher, who was a white woman, uh, had been making these comments for several days about how Black History Month is racist. And if we're gonna celebrate Black History Month, then we should celebrate White History Month. Now, for full disclosure, my middle school and even my class was extremely diverse. So it was weird to me to watch this woman make these arguments. And of course, we're 11 to 12 years old. So not a lot of students had anything to say about it. But I spoke up and I said, I don't, we already have White History Month 12 months out of the year. Why do we need to focus on celebrating White History Month when this is one month out of the year for Black people? And that's when it came to, uh, oh, Alicia, it's people like you who give Blacks a bad rep. And for me, it was, it was uh, insulting. It was confusing. It was violent. It was... Um, it, it forced me in so many ways to shut down and question because uh, I did not understand exactly the context that she meant, but I knew that what she was saying was something so heavy for me as a 12 year old girl. And I remember completely retreating and not saying anything the rest of class because I'm totally embarrassed. 
But then also I didn't say anything to my parents when I came home. And a heavy part that I discuss in the book is that, you know, when you're raised in a home with a black mother and black parents, you, if you have to go to the school, uh, then it needs to be something that's their fault and not yours. Because if it's something that I did, then it's a problem. And the way she presented it to me was as if I was the one at fault. So it came out by accident in a conversation with my mom in the car and she was shocked and her reaction was totally different from what I expected. And it was anger and her trying to make sure she understood in full what the conversation was. So as we progressed and we ended up, my parents put together a letter, sent it with me to the school to give to the principal as well as her. Um, when I was called to the principal's office to discuss it because my mother had scheduled a meeting with the principal, her and, uh, and her, I'm sorry. And when I was called down, I walked in and she's crying. And I could not understand, well, what are you crying about? Because you're the one who offended me. And it was, uh, like I said, then the first time that I recognized, one, white women's tears. And two, it was the first time that I realized that I could find people who advocated for me. And two, that I was going to have to eventually advocate for myself because this was not going to be the first time it happened. And that was the, I'm sorry, the only time that it happened. And that was one of the things that my mother uh, made sure that she discussed with me before that meeting is that what you experienced is something that will happen to you throughout your uh, life, unfortunately, as a black woman. And so it stuck with me all of these years. And I share that because I know that there are so many little black girls or black women who have been black girls and experienced that. We are uh, in, in the educational space, K-12, and it's not just black girls, it's black boys as well. We are often uh, made to be these aggressive adults when we are babies and we are oftentimes advocating for ourselves, there was just the video, what, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago with a nine-year-old girl who was um, uh, assaulted by the police because they were trying to uh, detain her and she kept screaming to them, I am a child, I am a child. But we don't get the benefit of a childhood uh, when we are dealing with white people who often in spaces of power will weaponize that, you know, their whiteness against us in ways that are harmful for generations or, or years to come. Math was my favorite subject. It always was and it still was even as a college student. And I talk about what would have happened if if in that moment, that's what turned me away from math. How many other students who just like me were in situations like that where um, it was a teacher who said something to them that had nothing to do with anything STEM-based and now they to it, it always resonates with them in a negative aspect. So that was the reason I shared it and that's the reason why um, to your point earlier about representation, that it's important not just to have representation of ourselves in these spaces in STEM, but more important to have people who don't look like us, who are pushing and fighting to make sure that they create a new and different culture that makes it okay for us to exist exactly as we are and still be seen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I know that there are, First, I want to say, you know, things like this uh, still happens today, even if people don't want to believe it. Things like that still happens today. So you sharing your story really helps, you know, students understand and teachers understand how, you know, they need to stand up for themselves and how they can also support um, students of color. Um, you know, I've seen it time and time again a student of color will try to push back on norms that they know are dangerous or just not right mm -hmm. and that impedes on their success not just in school but in life too mm -hmm. and i think it was um uh really um awesome that you shared that story in your book you. um there's one other part in the book that i wanted to bring up if you don't mind it's a chapter mm -hmm. called lift while you climb. This is an idea, of course, that I, you know, wholeheartedly uh, can relate to. I, I believe in that in my own story. You know, I stand on the shoulders of those who came before me, you know, who recognized something in me that that many times I, I had doubted, you know, 
Um, but in this chapter, you write, and I quote, it says, um, <clears throat> in a field like computing where we are grossly underrepresented, it's imperative that we all continue to lift while we climb. What does, what does that mean to you? What are you wanting to um, get across to your readers who uh, I believe you know, are largely um, females, but should also be males as well too? Right. Um. Yeah, so it's the mindset of um, even as I'm pushing through and trying to make space for myself, that I keep that door open and hold it open for others along the way, because regardless of where you think you still have to go, you've accomplished more than someone else and a lot of other people who are looking up to you um, for guidance and for encouragement and for representation. And so it's important that you always remember that as you're pushing forward, that you take a moment and look back and remember that there are other people watching you and needing you um, to, to not only succeed at your level, but make sure that you create that space for them. And I really, I give tribute to my mom and her friends uh, that she worked with. She spent her entire 34 year career at IBM as a programmer turned manager. But one of the things that I always remember that stuck with me is that when she began at IBM, there were uh, six, five or six black people who started on the same day. And they kind of formed this group that they just became really good friends and uh, grew together. And they all had kids the same age. So we all ended up, uh, you know, getting together for family events or through school. And they were very intentional uh, coming through IBM from the early 70s to the early 2000s, where they intentionally went and signed up for uh, recruiting trips at HBCUs. They made sure that they were the black people that students at HBCU saw that they got those resumes and they pushed them forward. And then as they moved into positions of leadership, they made sure that all of their interns were HBCU interns. So, uh, and that was really important, not just for the interns, but for me. I remember uh, growing up and every summer meeting all of these different interns from a and and Howard and Elizabeth City State that my mom would bring in and she would groom them. And they would create this network of individuals where we're kicking down doors for you, but we're expecting you to still take advantage of the um, positions that you're in right now and make sure that you do the same for someone else coming behind you. Yeah, I mean, that kind of um, makes me, you know, um think about how women of color and the black women specifically have had such an impact on society recently. Um, uh, and and earlier you mentioned, you know, the black women voting block that just made a huge difference um, in, in our elections. I wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit more and ask you about your perspectives on the influence of women of color on improving education, on improving community engagement, uh, perhaps even on on healthcare and and you know um, policies that affect uh, communities of color. Um, what are you know what are some things that we need to understand about the influence of women of color? So uh, there's a couple of things, and and I think we can always use um, the Black women voters as the example. A lot of times it's important for people to understand that black women aren't trying to save everyone. We're simply trying to save ourselves and by default, everyone else benefits. Because we tend to be uh, the most marginalized group uh, and because of that, it's like the uh, example of the curb cut effect in the disability rights movement, right? So with the disability rights movement, uh, in Berkeley, students protested because there were not enough curb cuts, which if for people who don't know, it's that um, little slab or ramp on the side of a curb that allows uh, anything with wheels to get off of the sidewalk without having that drastic drop. And there were not enough of those at the time in Berkeley. And so as a protest, some of the students with disabilities got concrete and just made their own crude ones. But the, people started to realize that 
when those students created those, the curb cuts actually benefited a ton of other people. So women who were pushing children in strollers or people who worked with, uh, who had to move dollies and things like that. And so it became this overall benefit to society when you think about um, when someone who was the least marginalized in terms of their identity did something to save themselves. They weren't looking to benefit everyone else. And so it's the same with black women. When we look at things like like healthcare, the mortality rates uh, for maternal, uh, the maternal mortality rates for black women. Um, just advocating for ourselves in doctor's offices or fighting to make sure that our children or, or we ourselves are recognized in education and not overlooked. These are reasons why people need to prioritize and amplify black voices in spaces because it's not just about uh, making it better for us. Even the people who work the hardest against us would benefit more if they just listen and believe all of the things that we are saying and t and take into consideration the fact that um, the least or the most marginalized group, I'm sorry, the most marginalized group is always going to be the group that has the best perspective of how to solve a problem for everyone. Yeah, along those lines, Nikki, um... What should the CSED community be doing to uh, better support women of color and people of color? Ooh, uh, <laughs> there's not enough time in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, first up, I will say um, they need to uh, stop amplifying the voices that tend to be the loudest in the room already. Right. There's a lot of uh, complaints and conversations that are had among communities of color in CS Ed because the voices that always get amplified tend to be white, even if it's in a space of diversity, equity and inclusion. There are white voices who are the experts when, again, the people who have the lived experience get marginalized. The people who are not at the most um, high ranking in terms of whatever rankings are put together, air quotes, um, of universities are marginalized. So I, now you, I'm talking about those individuals at HBCUs or TCUs or HSIs, right? We have to make sure that we are amplifying the voices of the people who look like the students we are trying to impact because not only do they have the requisite professional and educational background, they have the lived experience themselves as former students to know what works and what doesn't. The other thing that really needs to happen in this community is there needs to be a reckoning and acknowledgement of how long it has been done wrong and how we have failed in a lot of ways because of how we've refused to amplify some voices and prioritized others. Um, and I say this all the time, there are a lot of people who think that they are advocates in this space who are problematic, who have uh, enacted in some way um, some sort of violent rhetoric or activities. And I'm not talking about violence physically, but emotionally and mentally on students, on colleagues and others because um, they have been prioritized as the, as the experts and anyone who challenges their beliefs automatically gets labeled as a problem or silenced. And we have to have a reckoning ourselves with what that means and what that has cost. Because a lot of times when you look at anyone who's in a um, community of color in this space, be it black, be it indigenous, be it Latinx, um, there is a time lost in fighting these battles with people. We can't always focus on the work because we have to spend so much time uh, fighting to be seen and heard and respected and valued when other people automatically get labeled as the expert just because. So we have to get out of this white is right kind of mentality that is in CS education, especially, and it's flooring to me that that's been the case for so long, even in the education arm around diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's like what white people say and white voices say is what should work. And there are plenty of voices from the communities of color that are saying, 
No, that doesn't work. That's why the numbers haven't moved significantly like you think they should. But again, people keep leaning on the exact same people. Um, so for me, that's a big piece is um, acknowledging that piece and holding individuals accountable when these actions occur, uh, because again, it is a layer and level of violence that's happening. You know, people talk about these microaggressions and implicit bias. I don't buy into all of this as being implicit. A, a lot of it is very explicit and it's very intentional. And even if you want to present the argument that it is um, or that it's not intentional, a ton of feathers is still a ton. And so what does that mean when we spend so much time having to receive and um, deal with and address all of this, but others who are enacting it don't? Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, how to grow and develop anti-racist behaviors in, you know, and that, and that, that is not only integrated, but essential piece in CS education. Uh, implicit, explicit bias, we all know that exists because, specifically because of the great voids that exist in CS education. And, um, you know, again, those are hard conversations. Uh, people get very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about behavior that has existed for so long in education and trickles down to CS education. Um, you know, specifically, it's like where sometimes I feel like we're promoting the status quo instead of changing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know we don't have a lot of time in this episode to dive deeper into that, but I'd love to be able to continue conversations with you about that separately. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, so um, again, uh, we wanted to uh, conclude this episode again, kind of thinking back and honoring um, Black History Month, and um, the last couple of questions that we have for you is, uh, I wanted to ask you to share the voices of black influences that have been inspirational for you um, and, and talk a little bit about how they've guided and shaped you and your work. Yeah, so uh, I have to start first and foremost with my mom. Uh, it is very unique to uh, be a 43 year old black woman and have grown up with a mother who was a math major and a computer programmer her entire career. Um, it's somewhat of an anomaly to even be surrounded in a community with other black engineers. And, and so um, her experiences, I always uh, got a bird's eye view to. Um, the good and the bad. So um, as she was going through things, as I was going through things, she was explaining them to me in ways that um, that made sense and resonated as I progressed, uh, both through college as well as graduate school. And even now to date, uh, my mother is probably my automatic go-to when things are happening, good and bad, I'm going to her for advice. So she has kind of shaped and molded who I am. And I tell people a lot of times, to know me is to know that I am a carbon copy of my mom. It's just that the time that she existed in, she could not have as much of a, a, a amplification of her voice, but she she did as much as she could. Um, I'd say also, uh, I'm a huge music person. So for me, Nina Simone is one of those artists that speaks to being so unapologetically black. And I love watching videos of her just when she uh, pronounces the word black because she gives it this emphasis that I can't even, I can't even say, <laughs> but it's, you automatically know there's this pride and there's this intention. She's throwing it at you and forcing you to uh, reckon with it. And I love it. Um, so those are two great ones. Love uh, Audre Lorde, Toni Morrison, uh, James Baldwin, other individuals who have have done the work of um, talking about race, especially as it pertains to uh, other identities uh, and also how race plays a part in everything in American society. So for me, I'm a student of all of them and it, it really helps me to ground the work I do so that when I uh, speak to uh, people, I, I present things to my students in class that I have some level of knowledge that's not just my lived experience. I can articulate um, 
the syntax, the technical language that applies to it. So it makes it resonate more with my students. And I think that's been really important. And I would encourage everyone in the computing community to stop looking within our community for understanding of this and start looking at uh, some of the experts who have been doing this work since uh, the civil rights movement. You can go even back to the suffrage and the abolitionist movement. Uh, but particularly, you know, um, some of these writers, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, you know, Alice Walker, if you look at a modern day, uh, Roxane Gay, Tressie McMillan Cotton, um, a lot of these black women who are doing a lot of this work in spaces that as computer scientists, we tend to overlook because that's over there as social science. So we're, we're more concerned about theoretical stuff and, and algorithms and how this makes sense. But they're telling us every single day all the impact of the environments we create and the technology. And I add to that, you know, the Rua Benjamins, Sophia Noble, Simone Brown, who are specifically talking about technology and the, and the racism and the sexism and the misogyny and misogynoir that's in place. Uh, and, and we even go into some of the experts in computing who are doing this work. So Joy Bulamwini, Timnit Gebru, uh, Deb Raji, you know, these are voices and people that we all should be studying and learning from. I do every single day. And so there's so much to learn, but it's really about taking that time to step outside of yourself and saying, I don't know anything, so let me start to, to look to the experts who do. Yeah, um, I'd love, I would love to curate that list, you know, of, of uh, important uh, people for the CSED community to get to know um, and how their work can help push you know, the, the work on equity and racial equality and, and move computing education forward. Um, you know, I, I think that is uh, very important for us to, to do better at. Um, Nikki, thanks so much for spending time with us Thank today. You. Uh, Thank you. I just this wanna say, yeah, as I was listening to your stories, you know, I couldn't help but like further validate <laughs> some of the beliefs that I have that through your experiences, you know, when you talk about the bigotry and racism, you know, that, that you've experienced, those experiences for me, they, they transcend a whole bunch of inequalities in other areas of society. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about, you know, our community, uh, the healthcare, housing, I mean, you know, redlining, the justice system, you know. Yes. It's, Unfortunately, it's not just an education that, that is impacted by bigotry. So I really appreciate you, you know, sharing your knowledge. You've, you've, you're an incredible force in the CS education and a wonderful Thank colleague. You. I appreciate you sharing your voice so that, you know, we as educators and others can help students benefit from that kind of expertise. Um, so thank, thank you. you again. Thank you, Lynn. If you it's... too. You too. You're awesome. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much. If it's okay with you, we're going to uh, post some contact information on our YouTube channel in case there are, you know, folks that might want to connect with you. Mm -hmm. Big shout out to you, Nikki. Um, thank you so much. And, and to you. our audience, thanks for listening to this episode of Voices for Social Justice. Um, don't forget, we're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, uh, or check us out, see what's happening on Twitter and Instagram. That handle is uh, at GT underscore CCEC. Until next time, be safe and take care of each other. Thanks. Thank you.